Hello, everybody. Welcome back to History of Light Podcast. Your host, Jacob Berman. Today, I'm joined by frequent guest of the channel, Professor Dennis McDonald. Welcome back to History Valley, Dennis. Thank you very much. Let me uh, put on some glasses that don't have that uh, blue glare. Sure. Um, Jacob, I'm glad to be back to talk about a topic that's dear to my heart. But I also want your viewers to know that I now have a website that gives links to my books, to my CV, to upcoming publications, and to uh, webcasts um, or podcasts. So um, the way to find it is uh, all lowercase, no spaces, Dennis R. McDonald. That's why I put the R in my name this time, dot org. So D-E-N-N-I-S-R-M-A-C-D-O-N-A-L-D dot O-R-G. And I hope, uh, I hope that helps people get into some of this material. I'll also have the link in the description below. So if anyone wants to click on it, the link will be there below the video. Beautiful. Okay, let's start off with this question. What led you to conclude that Mary Magdalene, Joseph of Arimathea, and Judas Iscariot are fictional people created by Mark in Mark's gospel? Uh, uh, Jacob, I'm playing the role of a historian and not of a theologian. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm simply trying to assess the historical evidences we have for these three characters that, in my view, are wonderful characters. They mm -hmm. have rich reception histories. We all know about Judas, the archetypal villain, uh, Mary Magdalene as Jesus's girlfriend, and all the permutations that we have on that, including in the modern world. And uh, Joseph of Arimathea, who has a very active presence in Christian apocryphal writings. So these uh, characters are wonderful characters. I'm not trying to demean them. I'm not trying to say they don't have for Christians theological significance. I'm playing the role of historian. Let's take a look at the evidences that we have for these characters. Nobody in the ancient world, except for Judas and his father in the Gospel of John, have ever been called Iscariot. It's sometimes said that um, it comes from the word man of a karyoth, man of a village. And there is a village in antiquity called, in Palestine, called karyoth. It's, karyoth is simply an Aramaic word for village. I think it means into the city. Uh, a karyoth also can mean city. And I'll say why I think that's significant in a moment. Nobody in antiquity ever was called the Magdalene. Uh, Magdala is a city in Palestine that gets its name from Magdala, a word for a tower. And um, so it, Mary is from Tower Town. That's going to be significant as we go along. But again, neither of those characters, neither of those names, Iscariot or Magdalene, appears in any other connection. Arimathea is not a place on a map. Nobody before Mark wrote ever heard of Arimathea. And every reference to Arimathea afterwards apparently derives from the Gospel of Mark. Now, why is it that these three important characters, who arguably are the most driving characters other than Pilate and Jesus in Mark's passion narrative, seem to have names or rubrics or sobriquets that don't appear anywhere else? That really is quite curious. Now, related to that is evidence in the Gospel of Mark that Mark creates proper nouns. A very good example is Barabbas, which means son of the father, who's, who's preferred uh, by the Jewish authorities to the son of God. So here you have son of the father and the son of God in competition. 
and uh, people who should have sided with Jesus side rather with Barabbas. No map and no reference ever shows Dalmanutha, which was a, apparently a city on the Sea of Galilee. It's mentioned in Mark, but there's no other reference to it. In Aramaic, it means of the harbor. And there's a reason that it's of the harbor, because it's imitating the story in the Odyssey that takes place in a harbor, a famous harbor. We also have Bar Timaeus. Bar Timaeus means son of Timaeus. Timaeus means honored one. And um, he plays the role of Demodocus, who is said uh, is honored because he has such beautiful singing, a singing voice, uh, a blind man. And uh, we have uh, imitations of it in Mark. I could give other examples, but I think that's sufficient to say that Mark, like a good fictional author, uses significant names to uh, tip off to his readers that we're dealing with uh, a symbolic name. And um, Mary Magdalene, Judas Iscariot, and Joseph of Arimathea all fit into that pattern. So, um, and by the way, none of these three characters is ever mentioned in uh, the Pauline corpus. So that's the literature that is earlier than Mark that comes from Christians. There's no reference to it. What do you the same, think? Uh, the same thing is true of the Q document. If there is a Q document, and I'm convinced there is, none of these characters appears in the Q document. So, uh, and every reference apparently to these characters after the Gospel of Mark is directly or indirectly dependent on it. Now, as a historian, I would have to say that that is very slim evidence that we have reason to think these three characters have an important narrative function, but we don't have any external evidence that they existed. Now, again, as a historian, I can only talk in terms of probabilities. The probabilities seem to be um, very much in favor that they didn't exist. Now, um, we're going to get into the weeds on this one with each character. I'll tell you how um, uh, what the background is for Judas, and then for Mary Magdalene, and then for Joseph of Arimathea, simply because that's the order in which they appear in the Gospel of Mark. I'm sorry I inter interrupted you, Jacob. What, what do you want to say? I was going to ask you, um, before you get into the weeds on, the, on those three characters, um, what did Paul mean in, in uh, 1 Corinthians? Might have been in Second Corinthians uh, that Judas, not Judas. He said he said Jesus was betrayed and handed over. Yes, Jesus was somebody. handed over, and um, no, not well. There was an agent that betrayed him. Mm -hmm. um, some uh, argue that in fact it was God who handed Jesus over in order to be killed, in order to provide salvation to humankind. So the agent is not named. It could very well be that one of his opponents betrayed him and handed him over. It's possible that you have a disciple that handed him over. Um, what is clear is that uh, Mark has him, he uses the same word for handing over. And it's possible that Mark knows 1 Corinthians, uh, certainly Luke knows 1 Corinthians, um, and um, or at least knows the tradition of Jesus being betrayed, and then he creates the betrayer. So you're quite right. Yeah, it occurs in the 1 Corinthians. Hmm. All right, go ahead and uh, let's get into the weeds on Mary Magdalene, Joseph Arimathea, and Judas Iscariot. Um, to begin with Duke Judas, I'm going to uh, tell you something about the Odyssey. Odysseus mm -hmm. returns home and he's in disguise because the suitors will kill him if they recognize him. So Athena turns him into a beggar. 
which allows him to mill about the, um, the suitors without being detected. The, one of his slaves um, named Melanthius is sure that Odysseus has died either in the war or on his return. After all, he's been gone for 20 years and sides with the, um, uh, the uh, suitors and he's the goat herd. So he provides them with roast goat and joins in their feasts and, and drunken uh, cavorting and um, is um, really a, a nasty dude. His sister has a similar name, Melantho. Now, these two names mean black man and black woman. Hmm. It's the word uh, root that we get uh, melatonin, for example, or melanthia. Um, so, um, and their father's name is Dolios, which means deceiver. Here, I think, is one of the earliest references we have in the West to um, African slaves. Um, hmm. they, they seem to be black, a black man and a black woman, Melanthius and Melantho, and they're the slave children of a slave named deceitful, and surely the father was black. So that's just an aside, but it's quite fascinating. When one first meets Melanthius in the Odyssey, he is driving goats into the city in order to be slaughtered by the suitors uh, for their uh, feasting. Uh, this is, in my view, the uh, echo in Mark of East Karyoth into the city. And Mark three, three times talks about Jesus and telling his disciples that he is going to be betrayed in the city. So uh, that's the origin of Karyoth, I think. Now, Melanthius, um, so Melanthius sides with the suitors. And when Odysseus finally reveals his identity and starts to kill the suitors, Melanthius is able to get the weapons out of the storage area and arm the suitors. Um, and so there's this big fight. Odysseus finally wins. And the way that he um, uh, punishes Melanthius is to dismember him. And in fact, it says, and he hacked off his ears, his nose, and his limbs. Let's go to the Gospel of Mark. Judas trades sides to and uh, gives himself over to the murderous intents of the chief priests, right? So he's a betrayer. He becomes de facto their servant instead of a servant of Jesus. At the arrest, he comes in with an armed band of thugs. And he identifies Jesus, that the others couldn't, identifies him with a kiss. In the Odyssey, when, when servants recognize that Odysseus has returned, guess what they do? They kiss him. Hmm. It, way of uh, showing their their fidelity to him and their love but it's ironic for um, for mark then what happens one of jesus's followers hacks off the ear of quote the slave of the chief priest that's none other than judas in my opinion he's become mm. the slave of the chief priest and has, um, he's the one who recognizes Jesus with a kiss, and he's punished by having his ear chopped off, which is just what happens to Melanthius. So um, that's the end of Mark's story about Judas, but um, the, the, uh, Matthew and Luke and the Christian Apocrypha fill in the gaps and um, have a heyday with the Judas character. But it's likely that Mark creates him because he uh, resembles Melanthius um, and there was no character named 
Judas. But there's one more piece of evidence that's fascinating. Um, Luke has two versions of the list of the disciples. One is of the 12 disciples, and the other is of 11 disciples. His list in the gospel ends with two James Judases. One is Judas, the son of James. The other is Judas, the Iscariot. Now, he knows of the Iscariot because he's redacting Mark. But where does this other James, uh, Judas, the son of James, come from? And he appears in the list also in the uh, Acts of the Apostles, but not Judas Iscariot because he's going to, uh, the narrator is going to tell us about his death later. Now, in my view, the original list of the 12 ended with a Judas, the son of James. Hmm. And Luke gets one Judas, son of James, from the Q document, in my view, the other one from Mark. And it creates a kind of doublet where you have two Jameses at the end of uh, the list in Luke. In order to make that happen, he has to get rid of Thaddeus, that, who is a very minor character in any case. So actually have inside the Gospels evidence that Mark created Judas Iscariot from Judas the son of James. Isn't that fascinating stuff? I mean, really, when I first discovered um, the the uh, narrative similarities between these characters, I was really jazzed. Yeah, I think I think it makes even people that, um, regardless of someone thinks that Judas existed or not, um, like if there were a historical Judas, you'd have to at least concede that his story has been heavily modified by yeah, yeah. Mark's knowledge of the Homeric epics. That's insightful, Jacob, because as I said, as a historian, I can't be 100% sure that the evidence actually squares with the historical realities. So there may have been a Judas. In my view, the evidence is very thin. But as you said, in either case, Mark has embellished um, either created or embellished the character to uh, over and over again imitate Melanthius. Yeah. Let's talk about Joseph Arimathea and Mary Magdalene. Well, let's go to Mary Magdalene next then. Uh, she mm -hmm. appears for the first time in any text in Mark 1540, where it says, that there were three women who were watching the death of Jesus from a distance. And the names are Mary the Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and Salome. So again, she is the first person, and as far as I know, the only person who is called the Magdalene, the one from Magdala, Tower. In the Iliad, there are three women who watch Hector die from afar. That is, they're on the walls of Troy, and they're watching Achilles kill Hector. Um, Hector's wife is Andromache, and she watches um, all of this happen from, believe it or not, a tower. And then, uh, these three women are the ones who go to the tomb in order to uh, anoint Jesus. And, and in the Iliad, these three women lead the lamentations for Hector in Book 24 of the Iliad. So when these, um, when the women get to the tomb, uh, and so the, in the Iliad, these three women help bury Hector. And Bear, Hector, of course, does not come back to life. He's dead, and the city of Troy is now going to be destroyed. In the Gospel of Mark, however, the women go to the tomb and they find it empty. Now, which story is more hopeful? The one where Hector dies and the city's about to, to be destroyed, or the Gospel of Mark, where the women go to the tomb and Jesus has risen from the dead? This is called in Greek 
make a synchrosis, a, a comparison uh, to show that one character is uh, more virtuous than another. And so um, every reference to Mary Magdalene later on um, comes from Mark, ultimately. Now, here's another little piece that's curious. When Paul talks about Jesus appearing to the disciples in 1 Corinthians again, he mentions the 12. He says nothing about Mary Magdalene or the other women. Um, he talks about 500 seeing Jesus at one time, but Mary Magdalene is missing. Now, um, feminists, understandably, but probably wrongly, have assumed that Paul was a sexist, and therefore he knew about Mary Magdalene. If he knew about Mary Magdalene, he refused to mention that she was the, one of those who uh, saw uh, or witnessed the resurrection. And the Gospel of John goes further, and she's the first one to see the risen Jesus. Um, but... Um, so that's the historical evidence. There may have been a Mary Magdalene, all right? I don't think she was called the Magdalene, but it's possible that the women were involved. Uh, I don't know. Again, I think the historical probabilities are very low, but what is clear is that she plays a role that is very similar to uh, what we find in the Iliad for uh, Andromache. Now, there's one more piece of this puzzle that's fascinating to me. Byzantine Christians, both poets and prose authors, saw Mary Magdalene as a Andromache character. And how we know that, this is, this is why we know it. The Gospels are curiously silent about the uh, women's lamentation for the death of Jesus. In fact, they're silent. They don't say anything uh, uh, as a lament. Um, and we know that uh, women in antiquity were often hired to be singers at, um, at funerals and to have these lead the lamentations. And the women lead them lamentations in the Iliad, these three women, uh, Hecuba, Helen, and Andromache. When Byzantine poets uh, for the, uh, who wrote the Homeric Gentones rewrote gospel stories, they lifted lines from Iliad 22 and 24 that have the lamentations of Andromache, Hecuba, and to some extent Helen. So we have uh, already in, uh, still later on from the fourth of the ninth centuries, poets who see similarities between Mary Magdalene and Andromache. The same thing happens in a medieval version of the Gospel of Nicodemus, uh, preserved uh, in several, in quite a few manuscripts in Greek, um, that recently has been published by Remy Grunel, that um, has long speeches of the Theotokos, that is Jesus's mother, Mary, and um, uses the, uh, the lamentations of these three women from the Iliad, but also for Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene speaks with lamentations that are uh, almost, ob I mean, quite obviously coming from Iliad 24. It's a fascinating history. I love these characters, but I just don't think they exist. Hmm. And what about Joseph Arimathea now? Um, again, I'm going to start with a story in the Iliad. Hector is the son of Priam. And in order to defile the body, Achilles drags the corpse of Hector behind his chariot um, and uh, travels, uh, around, drags it around the city. Priam is... Um, to, obviously sorrowful, not only because his son is dead, but because Achilles is mutilating, trying to mutilate his flesh. Zeus sends his messenger Iris to Priam and says, 
uh, I gather a treasure of ransom for ransom of Hector, put it on a wagon and take it to Achilles and I'll make sure um, that you get there safely and offer the ransom for Hector and then bring his body back for a fitting burial. So that's exactly what um, uh, happens. Uh, uh, Priam gathers an enormous treasure, puts it on a wagon, he rides a chariot, and he and his um, servant Idaeus go over the plains, go safely into um, the hut of uh, Achilles, even though it's very dangerous, and return with the corpse, and then it's given a burial, uh, and over his uh, ashes they gather stones. So what happens in the Gospel of Mark? Joseph's, uh, Jesus' father would be Joseph of Nazareth. But it's not Joseph of Nazareth who buries his son. It's Joseph Arimathea. And Arimathea in Greek means excellent discipleship. So Joseph of excellent discipleship buries Jesus, but Joseph of Nazareth does not. Um, Pilate is astonished that um, Joseph dared, that is, it's a dangerous thing to go ask for the body from the executioner, right? Um, he dared to come to Pilate and ask for the body. Um, Pilate agrees and gives him the body and is surprised that the body is still intact, as was the case with Hector. Um, and Joseph gives him a fitting burial and puts a stone over the door of the tomb. But whereas Hector's body stayed in his tomb and the city fell, um, Jesus' tomb is empty. Again, when we go to Homera Chantonis in the medieval gospel of Nicodemus, the uh, lines from the Iliad are imitated in order to retell the story of a Joseph of Arimathea rescuing the body of Jesus. In fact, um, it's expanded in the Gospel of Nicodemus by about five times as long, using basically paraphrase from um, Iliad 24. So I don't know that I have much more to say about it. Um, it's possible that these three characters existed, but uh, as you said, whether they existed or not, Mark was clever enough to employ them mimetically to uh, drive his narrative, uh, a narrative that ends not in catastrophe, like the death of Hector, but in um, resurrection with the, uh, the uh, uh, resurrection of Jesus. Now, I'm sure that uh, many, faithful Christians are going to see this as heresy because it means that um, all versions of the passion narrative that survive from antiquity derive from Mark and Mark derived it not from history but from uh, uh, alternative mythology. And that's one of the reasons why I think the academy and the church has been so reluctant to embrace. I mean, that's one of the reasons they've been cautious about embracing Nemesis criticism. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.